some see the world through photography, but I see the world in dots, comic book dots. It's kind of like having a very specific window on the world. And not just any window, it's a comic book window. And in this window tonight, you're going to see my artwork of some of my favorite characters, Superman, Super Santa Claus, Jesus, the original superhero, Captain Israel, Super Money Man, Super Peace Man, Super Money Man. Ladies and gentlemen, tonight, Wendigo Productions presents Art on a Galleries. Life, art, and comic book art. The image for the show is taken from the image on the wall over there, what I call Super Money Man. It's the image that I thought would be perfect for an art gallery show, my first because everybody thinks the art scene is all about money. So I thought when I explain this image later, you'll know why it was the perfect image. And tonight I'm going to take you through a kind of virtual tour through the gallery and through my artwork. But first we want to know, who Hi, am I? I'm Alan Schumer. I'm a comic book artist and a comic book historian, lover of American pop culture, and welcome to my home. There's an entire history of Batman just in these figures that I've assembled, you have the Batman model kit from 1964. Here's the Batman of the animated series from the early 90s. Here's Robin first introduced, more of an imp. And then in the 1970s, that's what he looked like then. So the things in my apartment also show the history of how these characters developed over time. I've been drawing since I was three years old. And then in summer camp, and when I was five or six, I was turned on to comic books that were in the bunks. Uh, along with the Archies and Bettys and Veronicas, they were superheroes. And started drawing from looking at the comics and reading the comics. And they really taught me really everything I know about art, even though I went to a great art school and studied with great artists. What we're going to do is the actual nuts and bolts, old-fashioned, old-school, 20th century drawing. It's a little bit of magic. Okay, with this drawing of Iron Man, I took my pencil drawing, and I scanned it into the computer, and I printed it out, but in reverse of the way I penciled it. So that now, I'm going to flip it over on the light table, and now, on this side of the paper, I'm going to ink it with black line, and make those decisions of what to ink and how thick the line should be and where you should commit to black. Okay, so there's the logo for the show. I scanned this ink drawing in and that's how we got this drawing here. And you can see as I pull off these different layers, you can see all the different characters that I have here. There's your Batman in the background. Iron Man, Ares, my photo reference for him, picture of Brad Pitt from the movie, the shield is from a, another source, and the sword is from a third source. My Hercules is basically, I use Arnold Schwarzenegger. We have Zeus, which I based on the classic Zeus from Fantasia, the Walt Disney film. And that's basically how I'm going to create this composited image. I have a lot of work cut out for me. I have to finish inking these drawings and scan them in and color them. But thanks for coming. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. I'll see you in the funny pages. Or in an art gallery. Here's the finished image that I did for ABC 2020. They filmed that in my apartment in 2010. This was a one hour special about real people doing superhuman feats. So they wanted me to create an image to turn them into superheroes and contrast them with the uh, classic heroes. You can see I based my Superman in the image on one of the Superman I grew up, the George Reeves Superman. 
But really, the Superman I grew up with was the comic book Superman. And this was the very first image I saw of Superman. And it was this was the comic book I saw. And it was in summer camp when I was five years old. And there it is at my feet. <laughs> Comics were strewn about the bunks in summer camp everywhere you went. Uh, this was a postcard I drew to send back to my mother at home. You know, most kids were writing, send money or whatever, you know, there's see here's the card, you know, address to my mother back in New Jersey. Nineteen ninety six. And yes. This was based on the drawing on Sir Big was one of the first Aurora superhero models. And that's what it looked like when it was actually expertly made. My brother and I would make one of these over and over again. We'd screw it up, blow it up with firecrackers, or melt it, and then we'd buy it again. What's this we? Here's what the that's box you. goes. <laughs> hey, no heckling. <laughs> talking about you. Hey, this is live streaming. We're trying to put on a show here. <laughs> if you notice, the box the cover, box. They, the box cover painter actually made it resemble George Reeves. And wow. here's the box in the lower right corner. And here is the ad for the model that was on the back cover of the comic book at my feet. A couple of years later, I'm eight years old. Here I am in my bedroom reading a comic. Notice the clash of American interior decorating between our mother's idea of a boy's room, Ethan Allen, early American, and of course the comics which represent our culture. 1966, of course, was the year that the Batman TV show debuted. I didn't like it. I liked the Batman character, but even the comic book character started to resemble the TV show. And the TV show was camp and made fun of Batman. I didn't like that. Thank God in 1968, this artist Neil Adams came on the scene. This is a self-portrait he did in 1970. What he did was go back to the earliest Batman in 1939, which really hadn't been seen because there weren't reprint collections back then. No young comic fans were really familiar with an image like this, but he remembered it from his youth, and then he updated Batman for the late 60s after the TV show had done its damage. So this was 1939, but this is 1968. So Neil Adams brought a more realistic drawing ability and style to Batman, which is why you have 25 years later The Dark Knight. If it wasn't for Neil Adams doing what he did with Batman, you wouldn't be getting The Dark Knight. It's why. upper level corner even back then I never heard of graphic design but even back then I was giving myself a logo based on the DC Comics logo and finally last year I got around yeah. to actually working the logo up but you can tell I was already thinking in those terms and basically I decided to do the Orange of Batman I think for 12 years old, doing layouts like this, notice even you graphic designers out there, the big initial caps, <laughs> initial caps, what the? And then here's the last page of the story. And you can see the big Kate Neil Adams influence and the Batman. And I drew this with a fountain pen. Remember fountain pens? You put the ink in the cartridge? God, Raven remembers fountain pens. Anyway. This was the cover of the Batmania fan magazine. The first issue was 1964, and it had been published, I had known about it. So while I was in high school, a few years after that drawing, I contacted the publisher and I became the art director of Batmania magazine when I was a junior in high school. So this was one of the covers I did. You can see my art progressing a level. This was a double page spread pinup and this was back when I was experimenting with India ink and brushes. You know, nowadays, if you want to be a comic artist, you know what tools to get, all the information that's on the web. When I was a kid, learning what the pros used was like trying to find the Holy Grail. When we would hear something like Windsor Newton Series 7 Sable Brush Number 3, it was like yeah. a mystical rune and Higgins Black Magic India ink. Ooh. But of course, we young students would go to make these marks, and then I would look at original art at a comic convention, like, how come my art doesn't look like that? I've got the same tools. So, but you can see the Neil had the big cape influence and in what I was trying for. 
senior in high school, before I went off to Rhode Island School of Design, this was the cover that I did. And again, you can see my progression as I went on. As a professional illustrator, years later, this is 1992, after the second Tim Burton Batman film had come out, Entertainment Weekly hired me to illustrate an article about the previous Batman movies. And of course, I based it, like I do a lot of my illustration on, on classic comic book covers. Entertainment Weekly, I worked for them for many, many years on and off. You know, magazines change art directors, design directors, so you go in and out with certain magazines. So every once in a while, I get to illustrate the actual comic characters. This was for the New York Times a couple of years ago. <laughs> the year, yeah. Yeah, you like that? I got to draw Wonder Maybe Woman like and Spider-Man hanging out. But of course, there's Batman. This was the year that Iron Man and Indiana Jones and the, uh, the Dark Knight movie were all you know, coming out at the same time. <laughs> this was a Batman and Robin motif for Washington Post magazine a few years ago about a real life blind artist whose friend, who's not blind, draws comics that he comes up with the ideas for. So they hired me to do it, and you can see all of my lettering and my motifs, especially the composition, is right from the classic Batman and Robin by Carmine Infantino, mm -hmm. one of the great artists of the 1960s. He's the Batman artist of that decade. If you go back further to the 1940s, this is the look of the classic Batman and Robin, a spotlight cover. This was an artist named Jack Burnley. That image figured in the series of exhibition panels I did about the art history of Batman. There's the full, this was a 55 inch by 27 inch panel hanging in the Wurzen Picture Museum in Northampton, Massachusetts, which is unfortunately no longer there. That was the museum started by the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles when they made all that money and they lived in Northampton. So I did a series of panels, here's a photograph, you can see them hanging. Uh, in 1997, I think, whatever the anniversary was, and each panel is like a different artist in a different era of Batman. So the initial era, Bob Kane, Jerry Robinson, those early artists, I tried to show in a verbal visual format how Batman came to be, and the fact that one of the ideas, according to Bob Kane himself, from Batman is the Leonardo da Vinci flying wing, if you've seen the reproductions. Now that image comes from the very first time we see Batman, May of 1939, it's the 75th anniversary. The reason why I'm showing you this image that the artist is Bob Kane, except Bob Kane had a partner. His partner's name is Bill Finger. Obviously, by the cloudiness of these images, there's very few photographs left of these guys from that era. Bill Finger, you probably never heard his name, but he was incredibly prolific. Not only did he co-create with Kane the entire Batman universe, but for DC Comics, he died in 1974, over the years, he co-created Green Lantern, he created Superboy, he wrote so many stories, and in those days they went uncredited. So most people didn't know about Bill Finger. But the reason why it's significant, especially for this um, art show, is that when Bob Kane showed Bill Finger the first sketch that eventually led to this image, it didn't look like that at all. Bill Finger made a series of suggestions like an art director would, even though he was a writer, he was a very visual thinker. And he said, Bob, make it look more like a bat, turn the wings into this, and I'm gonna show you exactly what he did. But what I set out to do as a comic historian back in 1999, there was going to be a special trade magazine about Batman's history. And I decided, because that first sketch that Kane showed Finger has never been shown or published. Maybe Kane erased it or drew over it. But I, based on Kane's and Finger's own verbal descriptions, I set out to draw that image to see what would Batman look like without Bill Finger. And basically, this is what I came up with. This is based on both Bill Figures and Bob Kane's own words in an interview. When I needed a sketch to base the figure on, I knew that Kane, from reading interviews and articles, was a notorious tracer of Alex Raymond's Flash Gordon. So when I needed to find an image for this figure, I said, let me look in some old Flash Gordons. Well, I happened to find 
the exact swipe that Bob Kane used for the famous cover of Detective 27. Nobody in comics history had ever, they thought Bob Kane made that figure up, but I found it in a little panel from two years prior. So I put together this image that's hanging on the wall, and basically it shows all the different components. You see the dictionary page up there? That was when Finger looked at the mask and said, Bob, you're calling him Batman. Make his head and mask look like a bat. He actually went to the dictionary and got a picture, you know, looked up bat and said, Bob, here it is. And then here's how it looked like for the cover of Alter Ego magazine in 1999. And then you open up the magazine and here's the article detailing pretty much everything that I've been saying. The reason why this is significant now is that there's a movement the last couple of years to get Bill Finger official credit. Bob Kane had a lawyer father, so when he went into D.C. with a sketch, his father made sure he was covered, but Bill Finger was left off of it. Bill Finger dies penniless in 1974, while Bob Kane goes around telling everybody how he created everything. He let his partner die penniless. The minute he was dead, Bob Kane is crying crocodile tears, poor Bill Finger, should have gotten credit. The very first comic convention I went to in New York City as a kid with my brother, the 1973 July 4th convention, where right now the Grand Hyatt is, next to um, um, Grand Central, used to be the Commodore Hotel. Mm -hmm. Bob Kane was the keynote speaker of that convention. I'm 15 years old, my first comic convention, Bob Kane. Here's what I remember from his keynote speech. Remember, Bill Finger was still alive. He dies in February of 74. I create a Batman. I create a Robin. I create I, I, I. Just a series of I statements. So here we are years and years later, and there is a movement. A couple days ago, I'm going to show you the reason behind this picture. This is Athena Finger, the granddaughter of Bill Finger, and that is Shelley Mayer, the granddaughter, and I'll tell you about her in a little bit, who really is responsible for getting Superman published. And they were both here, so they're really conflict royalty. But Athena, Athena Finger is taking up the mantle, along with some other people in comic fandom, to get Bill Finger credit. This is a book by Mark Tyler Nobleman, all about um, Bill Finger. And the illustrator who did it, Ty Templeton, did this illustration only six months ago. And basically, using the idea that I came up with and it's funny, I did my thing in 1999, and here we are years later, and it's obviously penetrated the consciousness to a point. This is on Facebook, this is um, words for a documentary film that's being kickstarted about Bill Finger. So there's a lot of stuff happening. This is promotion for an off-off-Broadway play by a friend of mine that I met through Facebook, Roberta Williams. And what it is, it's called Fathers of the Dark Knight, He's a high school teacher of music and voice, and he's getting an entire student cast to play the roles and do a behind the scenes story of the creation of Batman by Bob Kane, Bill Finger, because it's a very, it's a classic American story of success and tragedy. So I, of course, offered to design the poster for the show. And that's the finished poster that's hanging on the wall next to the Batman Bob Kane sketch. And here is my rough sketch that I showed to Roberta Williams. And if you look closely, I want you to notice, I originally didn't have the Batman head. I had the H as two bars, somewhat evoking the Batman cowl. But I showed this to a friend of mine, and he said, Arlen, why don't you put the Batman head? And I said, well, as a typographer, I thought if you close off the top of the H, it's going to look like an A. You're not going to know that it's an H. But I actually listened to his suggestion. Oops. I thought I had the image. I'm sorry. I won't wait, 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 wait. Anyway, you can see I ended up putting the head in, and the H still works as an H. So I'm sorry I messed that up. I thought I had the image right after this. Getting back to Shelley Mayer on the right there, this is her grandfather. Sheldon Mayer was an editor for DC Comics in 1938, and he was in charge of finding material for the very first issue of Action Comics. This is what's called an Ashcan cover, a made-up cover that they sent to the Copyright Office 
in order to get copyrighted. But it was Sheldon Mayer's job to fill the issue with something. He was looking through the slush pile, and if you know what a slush pile is, most editors and publishing, they've got a pile of unsolicited material that's sent in. So DC Comics had a slush pile, and in the slush pile, Sheldon Mayer digs deep, and that's why, if you look at the bottom, in June of 1938, this comic appears. Yeah. And if it wasn't for Sheldon Mayer, there really would be no Superman. He saw something he liked, he thought it had potential, he liked the whole Clark Kent, uh, Lois Lane dynamic with the alter ego, and that's why we have Superman. Over the years, as an illustrator, I've done knockoffs of Superman using that Action Comics lettering that I love to pay homage to. So this is a takeoff on the opening thing, faster than a speedy bullet, more powerful than a locomotive, but it's directed really to the ad world and really to account executives who think that going with creative, you know, we got to save money, we don't want to trust creative. So I'm trying to say it's faster than a speedy bullet and it's more powerful than a locomotive. Yeah. It's able to increase small billings if we found. <laughs> Look, it's a good buy. It's a word of the planet. It's super creative, man. And this, I sold it to the Art Direction magazine, the trade magazine of the field. I've used it in advertising illustration of comic style. You can see the Action Comics A for the word adventure. This was a series of ads for Three Musketeers that actually appeared in the comics. Most of my stuff, stuff that's on the walls, I've never drawn comics for the comic companies. So I've always done stuff in the comic style, but for advertising in magazines. So you can see how as a graphic designer, <clears throat> I actually base the opening logo on the bar itself with the three stripes on the side. But I always try to work in classic comic book motifs. Of course, in addition to action comics, then you have Superman. And look at how a couple issues later, the Superman logo, the classic telescopic lettering, got refined from Joe Schuster's original. So I, of course, have knocked that off many times. This was the summer announcements issue. We got a cease and desist from Paul Levitz, the publisher of DC Comics. And he said, you've cleverly positioned his red towel to read as a cape. And I'm going, uh, yeah, that's why it's called satire, parody. The same year for Adweek magazine, they needed an article about how the networks have to become super salesmen in order to compete with cable. So of course, the minute I heard that, I said, the networks are like Clark Kent, and they've got to become Superman. The very same year, 1989, two years after Andy Warhol died, I did this image. Now, what's the story behind this image? What do we know about Andy Warhol in comics, especially in an art gallery setting? Everybody knows of him from the silk screen, the chicken soup can. Most Warhol fans, unless they really know their Warhol, don't realize that before he did those silk screens, he painted comic book panels, not exactly like Roy Lichtenstein, but he would take comic book motifs and paint them. This is 1960, 61. This is a year and two years before his silk screens. This is what he did with Popeye. But then somebody invited him over to Roy Lichtenstein's studio, I believe, in 1961. And he saw what Lichtenstein was doing with comics. And basically, Warhol said, he's doing it better than I am. I'm going to leave the comics to him, and I'm going to go to the Silk Screen stuff. But he obviously loved comics. Years later in his career, he did this Silk Screen of a later Superman. But the reason why I bring this up tonight is that, and why I did that image super fraud in 1989 was, two years after he dies, the Museum of Modern Art gives him a major retrospective, the first real Warhol retrospective. And I'm walking along St. Mark's Place, and I pick up the big catalog resume, and I leaf through it, and I see these collages. These are roughly, there was a double page spread of them, so there were about eight of them. I had never seen them before. Remember, Warhol's early comics were paintings of comic book images. These are actual collages with the actual comic book panels pasted on and then splattered with watercolor and then signed Andy Warhol, 1960. Well, here's the only problem. I looked at these images. I was reading Superman back in the 60s. Those comics come from 1969. How could a collage 
be dated 1960. Oh, shit. Yeah, hello, using panels from 1969. A friend of mine, a comic book fan, his sister worked for the San Francisco Chronicle, and they wrote up this story. Again, 1961 collage, 1964 comic book. I then worked up this image and literally took it around to every major newspaper and media outlet in New York City at the time, the Village Voice, some of the art magazines. And I wanted to say that I don't believe Warhol made these. If you know anything about the factory, I guarantee you somebody from his factory decided, hey, as they're cutting up panels, nobody is going to know that these are panels. But that shows what really irked me to get to do this. Whoever made these frauds, and if you know about Warhol, he had his mother sign his artwork. So I don't think Warhol did these himself, but you never know. But let's say somebody in his factory did it, or not in the factory. Right. The contempt they had for comic book art, to think that nobody did, did For this to wind up in the Museum of Modern Art show and the catalog, think of how many people it had to get past. The gallery, it was called the Robert Miller Gallery, their famous gallery. It got past them. It got past Museum of Modern Art. Now, if you know about Warhol, he was sued by the photographer who shot irises that he silkscreened. And he was brought into court because the photographer thought it was infringement, and Warhol set it out of court. So the art world can surely recognize fraudulent photography. They can recognize fraudulent sculpture. But obviously, they don't know a thing about comics that a fraud of this percentage could get past, but it didn't get past me yeah. and my friend Richard Shias. But meanwhile, not one New York media outlet touched the story. Nobody did a follow-up article. Consequently, though, about a year later, all those collages were removed from the traveling Warhol thing. But the bottom line is, the catalog resonated in the Museum of Modern Art for eternity now has fraudulent images by maybe the greatest, most well-known artist of the second half of the 20th century after Picasso. And there are frauds in the collection. And because it's comics, nobody cares. And I find that sad. And that's why I've spent so much of my career trying to elevate comics in my purview, which is the commercial art, graphic design, and art direction world. So in 1988, I got print magazines to commit to a special issue on comics. They used to have a feature in the back, oh, that, excuse me, that I designed the cover for. If you notice, it's got the letters C-O-M-I-C-S. The images in each side refer to an article inside the issue. And just like in the beginning, the window pane design is the classic six panels to a page comic book page, but that also functions as another window on the world. Print Magazine would have a feature in the back of every issue back then called the design scene that they would give to a different artist or designer each month to let them comment on the design scene, whatever that was. So the, the month I was given it, I decided to do this image. And this is from 1992, this is 22 years ago. And I'm addressing basically the public. And I'm telling them, comic books should be treated as books, they're books. Comic books are art, hello, here we are. Comic books are art. Forget about my art. Comic art hangs in museums and galleries now. It wasn't back then. And comic books are graphic design. Why won't you listen to me? <laughs> but I'm standing on Warhol's Brillo boxes. I've got all little, you know, it's like Mad Magazine. It's all in the details. So I've got artist documentaries, Lust for Life and Agony Ecstasy. He's in the Christ position. Instead of Inri, he's got the Coca-Cola above his head. You've got Lois looking on. you got Clark Kent walking past. You have Steve Heller, the New York Times book review, <laughs> in the center. And that's the image hanging on the wall here. Any Superman image I do is an homage to the Superman artist I grew up with. My first favorite artist, but back then, as you can see by this image, DC Comics didn't let any of the artists sign the artwork. So none of us knew, growing up, who this artist was. But we all knew it was the good Superman artist. His name was Kurt Swan. And basically, his name was like his art. If you think of a swan, resolute, solemn, beautiful, there's something about that. But it's a curt swan. 
couple of years later, after he died in 96, they did a book about him. And I did a historical feature about his art. And again, I based it on the Superman logo. And wherever I can incorporate all the motifs in the work that I do, I do. I also use the Kurt Swan Superman. This is a very close up image. And the poster as we proceed down the wall here, this is my promotional poster for an upcoming series of webinars I'll be doing in the fall. And it's based on my book, The Silver Age of Comic Book Art, which was standing up here before. But these are all the artists that I cover in the book. My book came out in 2003. It's now out of print, but I'm working to get a revised and expanded edition back in print and digital as well. There's the title page of the book, and these are all the great artists from the 1960s, which is also called the Silver Age, because comic book historians consider the Golden Age, the 1940s, when all the superheroes and comics began. But these are the artists of the second wave of superhero creation, which was the late 50s, which has been dubbed the Silver Age. And that's when all the Marvel Comics characters, the Fantastic Four, Spider-Man, all those in the DC Comics characters, starting with Infantino, he drew the Flash. Here's a double page spread from my book. History books before mine were type heavy with miniature reproductions. I love the art of comics. When you thought of Infantino, he delineated two dimensional speed. By the way, this is why I wear a white jacket when I lecture about comics, <laughs> because it, you know when you stand in front of the colorful projections, it looks like it. But he delineated speed on a two-dimensional plane like no other artist before or since that had become graphic standards. But I wanted to do a book that was about the artwork, and the text is actually the artist talking about the artwork. So you read it like a comic, it's got multiple panels, but it's a history book, but it's also an art book. Here's a double-page spread that ends the book on the introduction to the artist Neil Adams, who brought a certain degree of photorealism into the make-believe world of comics. And if you think it's easy to draw a grown man crying, and you think it's easy to draw a grown superhero man crying, good luck, because really Neil Adams was the only one ever to pull it off. This is the last page of the Adams chapter. And the reason why I chose this image is because the angle that he chose, this worm's eye view looking up, no other artist in comics before ever mastered this kind of anatomy and this kind of perspective before Neil Adams. That's why I consider him to be one of the greatest comic artists of all time, to the point where when I saw this image in 1974, at the tail end of his DC Comics career, I was really dumbstruck by it because I thought it was maybe the single greatest drawing of Superman ever done. And when I think of Michelangelo's David and what we're taught in art history, that this is the greatest living example of a human being creating the perfect man, I don't see this as any better in a way than I see the Neil Adams Superman. But if I were to make that statement in an art history venue, oh, that would be blasphemous. Well, call me a blasphemer, baby, because here's an upcoming article I'm working on Comparing the two, compare and contrast, as well as others, and I'm calling it art and comic book art. And here's the opening double page spread where I begin the discussion how comic art was co opted by pop art. Mm -hmm. But the point I'm making here is that the art that the fine artists did to knock off comics was never as good as the comic art itself. Look how flaccid Mel Ramos' Superman is compared to Kurt Swan's Superman. And, you know, here's Andy Warhol stuff. Anyway, this is an article in progress. So these are the image spreads without any of my text. But again, here's a spread for Infantino. He himself said that he got his very elongated figures from Modigliani. And he got the grace of his figures from the paintings of Degas and the ballet dancers. We're taught that the greatest two-dimensional version of speed on a flat plane is Marcel Duchamp's New Descending Staircase. Well, I don't have any problem with thinking Infantino's depictions of speed are also definitive. This is the famous Japanese wave from the 14th century. I find this image by Infantino 
just as beautiful, if not more. Here's the Jack Kirby double page spread. Mm -hmm. See, I take the role of the aliens. If aliens came and you showed them the Pieta, either as a photograph or in person, and you show them a Jack Kirby Thor cover, unburdened by 500 years of art history, I don't think they would necessarily say, oh, well, this is so much better, and how dare you even dare to compare and contrast a comic book image to the great Michelangelo. In the same way, I'm comparing Jack Kirby's panoply in Captain America, the pencil drawing, to Picasso's Wanaga. Yes, they're for two different usages. Yes, one's a painting, one's about a real-life incident, blah, 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 blah. But the point is, as imagery, as beautifully done graphics, here's Goya's, um, um, I forget the title of this famous Goya painting, of these citizens being mowed down by the Spanish Guard, with Kirby's over there about uh, remembering his World War II experiences of the European peasants getting mowed down by the Nazi war machine. So it's spreads like this that have never been done before that are going to come out this fall on a beautiful hardcover anthology book. But there's my book, and if you can see at the bottom, it says revised and expanded edition. Here's the promotion I'm doing for the digital edition, because somebody said, Arlen, you're the Silver Age sensei. So I said, okay, I'll draw myself as Dr. Strange. <laughs> so yeah, that's kind of self-portrait. And there I am conjuring up the digital edition, because I think these spreads on a digital platform are going to look gorgeous. So, and then, you know, the webinars will happen. I based that image on this classic Neil Adams wraparound cover that had all the figures standing there in the spotlight. It was also an, uh, an influence on the next image in the gallery, my poster for the cast and crew of Kevin Smith's <laughs> television series, Comic Book Men. <laughs> now, I developed a technique where I keep the photographic resemblance but I add the black line and sometimes the dots to keep a sort of a middle ground between the photorealism and the comics. But there's, of course, the crappy logo that they actually used on the show. Here's me. I was a guest on the show. Um, I was filmed in the fall of 2011. They aired it in spring of 2012. There I am making believe I'm selling my only Golden Age comic, the classic Spotlight cover, <laughs> which, of course, I would never sell. It was all made up. You know, if you think a reality show is reality, I mean, it's all scripted and made up, basically. And it's crap. Yes, exactly. But I want to show you that I based, uh, oh, I call this Finding Your Inner Superhero, in which I take the photographic resemblance and mix it with the comic book look to come up with a middle ground between um, illustration and photography. So I met this woman, she's an artist from LA and an actress. And she looked like a female secret agent to me, so I based her on the classic Nick Fury angel. So her name was Nikki Sabbat. I said, you're Nikki, the agent of Sabbat. You're sensual, artistic, bomb bombshell, <laughs> expressive. And what is that last one say? Oh, and she's the Terminatrix. I don't know. Where Terminatrix. This is a dancer I met here in the city at a restaurant. He's sitting next to me, and one more there to another. And he said, um, I go, what do you see yourself as? He's a dancer. He goes, Arlen, I see myself as an archangel. So he sent me his photograph. There's my black and white drawing. And there's the finished image turning him into the archangel of his dreams. I also want to show you that I based the logo on one of the classic comic book logos by the same guy that did the Superman logo and all the great DC Comics logos. One of my illustrations I based on the Just League of America this was for the Joyce Theater in Manhattan. And every year they do a different catalog, or I think twice a year. So one year they said, let's do superheroes of dance. So I base all of these characters, jeté the leaper on dance terms. The word batma means movement in French. I said, are you kidding me? Are you giving me the word batma? And, and you want me to create superheroes of dance? So again, it kind of designed itself. That was arabesque. But I don't always do DC knockoffs, I sometimes do Marvel knockoffs. My brother works for IBM, and not that he had anything to do with this, but I had to create an IBM superhero, notice the letter I, right there, Captain Info. And of course, what did I base it on? 
the classic Captain America by Jack Kirby. Another Kirby character that he did when he went to DC Comics was Omak. He was a futuristic character with this cool mohawk. And the reason why I'm showing you this is that this, this figure is in the next piece of art on the wall based on this Kirby character, Omak. The Jack Kirby Museum was giving this unpublished pencil illustration out to different artists for them to ink it as a way of showing how different inkers would approach inking Jack Kirby. So I was about to start inking this when I met an artist at San Diego Convention named John Jennings, black guy, and he was doing this whole investigation to a concept called Black Kirby, and was mixing Kirby imagery with what he called Afrocentric and Afrofuturist motifs. And I was very intrigued by that. And I said, can I do something for Black Kirby? So I was thinking, you know what? First, let me do a verbal visual essay on the Black Panther, the first black superhero created by Jack Kirby. And then, as I learned about the history of the Black Panther, I realized that so much of the Black Panther's attitude was based on Marcus Garvey, who was the original black nationalist, and he came up with pan-Africanism. So the whole idea of African-American comes out of Marcus Garvey in the 1920s and 30s. And he was an influence on Martin Luther King. And um, he would sometimes dress flamboyantly like this as a way of eleva elevating, back then, what was called Negro consciousness. So I decided, when I'm going to go to Inc., OMAC, I'm going to mix it with Marcus Garvey and come up with a character I called O Black. And when I added the type, he's one black man liberating Afro consciousness. And the words here are actual words from an editorial he wrote while he was in prison. So again, Martin Luther King's career followed Marcus Garvey's very well. And here's a shot from the opening. You can see O Black. And the next image we're seeing, that's an artist friend of mine, Kurt Haas. The next image you can see in between is a poster that I did for Azuri, the Italian soccer team, a couple of years ago. And the reason why I'm showing you this is, I don't know too much about soccer. I don't watch it. I'm a football fan. But I do know that Italy is called the boot because graphically it looks like a boot. And I thought, well, let's see. i got to do an Italian soccer sure. poster. Italy is the boot. So the boot should kick the soccer ball. So I tried to get the figure of my soccer player actually in the shape of the Italian map. And I actually based it on this photo reference that I found, and I kind of flopped the figure, and that's how I got that image. To the next of Missouri, you see the Alfa Romeo image. My brother took this picture at the opening, and I thought, wow, how perfect. The Alfa Romeo red logo going right into Grace's blonde hair, for those live streaming this, Grace is the curator manager of this art gallery. And I have the Superman image right above my head like a thought balloon because I certainly <laughs> felt like Superman not only the night of my opening, but in this picture <laughs> as well. So the Alfa Romeo, uh, I was asked, it was a kind of a group show. A bunch of artists were asked to interpret Alfa Romeo. You could use the history, you can use the aspects of the car. So I thought to myself, what would I do in superhero terms? And I thought, OK, I'll have a race with the Italian Roman god of speed, Mercury. Once again, you recognize the lettering from Action Comics. Mm -hmm. But of course, I based it on a classic comic book cover, Superman versus the Flash by Carmine Infantino. There's my pencil sketch. And there's the finished art. As we go down to the end of the hall, look all the way to the right behind the curtain here, you'll see this little ensemble of framed art with a couple of three-dimensional pieces. What those are are cards I did for pop shots. They're no longer around, but they were a three-dimensional pop-up pop card company. This was the cover of the proposal that I drew and wrote up, pitching them. Back in the early 90s, they had every genre imaginable, except they didn't have comic book art which I thought would translate perfectly to, um, to comics. Do you think we could crack the door open to get some air in here? Yeah. Is that possible? Because yeah. I thought it might maybe be good. So you can see that here is the flat art 
that I produced. And then here's a photograph of the actual three-dimensional car mounted on the wall. And I got to work with Top Shots had these two Asian women that were so pristine with their tools and they were origami masters in how to deal with folded paper and how to make a flat piece of art translate into the three-dimensional pop-up cards. So now as we round the corner, you can kind of see to the right of the image, we're gonna round the corner to what I call the Bruce Springsteen wall. Bruce! Exactly. Now why in the middle of this comic book thing is there a Bruce Springsteen wall? So you can see the images on the wall. I did these when I was still at Rhode Island School of Design, still a student. This first image, I call this the guitar image. I did this in 1978 during Bruce's Darkness on the Edge of Town tour. This was an ad for the very first time he played Madison Square Garden, which was the very first time I saw Bruce. And I love this image and I based that guitar image on it. But it was used for his roadies. I knew somebody that worked with Bruce Springsteen's roadies. This is a photograph from the 1980 tour book and it's from 1978 and there's my image actually on the t-shirt. As we go down the line here, you'll see the next image. I was the art director. First, I was the art director of Batmania magazine. Then when I'm in college, I found out the first fan magazine for Bruce Springsteen called Thunder Road had just been published. And I thought to myself, I've got to become the art director of that. So there's my name. And what this image is, that's the cover of the magazine. The title is taken from the Robert Mitchum movie mm -hmm. that Bruce got the title from. But this is an image of Bruce Springsteen on September 19, 1978, delivering the monologue introduction to how he came up with the title Thunder Road. It's the only time in his career that he actually delivered the story. And the image that I drew was a visualization of this monologue, and he said, there was this Robert Mitchell movie, and it was about these moonshine runners down south. And I never saw the movie. I only saw the poster in the lobby at the theater. And I took the title when I wrote the song, but I didn't think there was ever a place that was like what I wrote in the song. I didn't know if there was or not. And we were out in the desert over the summertime driving to Nevada. And we came upon this house on the side of the road this Indian had built. Had a big picture of Geronimo on the front with landlord over the top had a big sign said, this is the land of peace, love, justice, and no mercy. And it pointed down this little dirt road that said Thunder Road. So that was my visual interpretation of that image. Then we see this marquee image. That was done for the Capitol Theater of Passaic, New Jersey. That's a place rock and roll history was made there, but of course they tore it down, just like they did the Fillmore East yeah. in this neighborhood. And the bottom line. And the bottom line. I took that image from a photograph in high contrast. It had to be in some magazine. I've forgotten over the years where I got this from. And maybe it wasn't high contrast. Maybe I had it photostatted to appear high contrast. And there it is, painted by sign painters up on the Capitol Theater marquee. Yeah. And here's how it looked in color. It was actual yellow plexiglass. It ended up being Bruce Springsteen's most legendary show. Nobody knew going into it, but I was in the sixth row with my friends. And yes, there I am with my cousin Barbara. There I am wearing the tour shirt in the middle. My friend from RISD, David Reese. Barbara was my cousin who got me into Bruce. And then as we go towards the end, the final image there, this was actually, it looks like a poster, but it was actually reproduce in the eight and a half by five and a half inch program so cool. but it was photostatted out this was like page two you opened up the cover and you came to that and it was actually photostatted and enlarged for years i would go to record stores remember record stores <laughs> and in the back there would be posters on the wall oh, I sure and i would see my poster bootleg photostatted right out of the thing that's amazing I also, it's not on the wall, but the reason why Bruce belongs in here is he is the superhero of rock and roll. Yeah. He's 64 years old this year, 
and he's got more energy and passion and enthusiasm than guys who play in bands a third his age, and I see those bands. I know. I'm so serious. for the 10th anniversary of Born in the USA, I turned him into Captain America, the superhero of rock and roll. Yeah. And that's why my art and Bruce belongs in this show. But speaking of rock and roll, uh -huh. as we turn the corner, what is this? But my one and only Elvis image, I don't even like Elvis. I think he's overrated. I think he's the Lucille Ball of rock and roll. Yeah. If you think of I Love Lucy as his 1950s, he has the and the bartender. Oh, right. But this is actually a painting on canvas that I collaborated on with my friend Meredith Miller, New York artist. We both went to RISD together. And I guess uh, in the late 90s, we must have been talking. I said, I don't even like Elvis, but if I were ever to do an image of Elvis, I would have Colonel Tom Parker. That's the photograph of the guy in the back. If you know Elvis's history, yeah. Parker controlled his career, took 50%. Parker's responsible for basically putting Elvis in all those crappy 60s movies and doing all that horrible music in the 60s before he basically recovered to the comeback special. But I believe that Elvis was neutered. His 50s rock and roll cred was neutered by Parker in order to make money. So I came up with this image in black and white, gave it to Meredith, and she ended up doing the color. This is a computer colored version that I did recently because we're not selling the canvas, but if you want to buy the image, you can buy the computer colored version that I did. But that's basically my Elvis image. And I guarantee you, you can look far and wide. There is no other Elvis image, and there's a million of them, of course. But I guarantee you there's no Elvis image like this that talks about how Parker was a corrupting influence and basically killed Prezi so that he might live as a money-making icon, which he was successful at. The last time he looked good was the 68 special. After that, it was downhill, man. Well, then he went to Las Vegas. That was a fan of Elvis. I'm saying this as a, as, as, I'm yes. saying this as a, as well, a fan of early Elvis. If it wasn't for that 68 like comeback Elvis. special, we would never have heard of Elvis anymore because of what Parker did to him. Right. Now, speaking yeah. of icons, uh, that yeah. Yeah. what do we see? <laughs> my picture of Grace, the curator and owner of the gallery. She met me when I was in a group show a couple months prior to the show. And this was the art that I had framed also here in the East Village of Theater for the New City. It was a show called The Struggling Cartoonist. I don't like the title, but it was about comic <laughs> artists who were using comic art in different ways, not in traditional comics. So there I have my PMS bars, chocolate bars with my screaming women <laughs> with a tagline for any time of the month. They rejected, <laughs> they rejected my other copy line, which was best she chocolate bars, period. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, a couple years later, Kotex comes out with a print ad yeah. campaign that used blah, 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 period. Yeah. And you know, they, they thought mine was so risque. Mm -hmm. But anyway, so obviously I belonged to the show and I presented myself and Grace came up to this artwork and I was standing there by the show and she said, I like your art more than anybody's in the show. And I was very flattered and we got to talking and she said, why don't you come visit me in my gallery further downtown? And I did and then I was here and she said, Arlen, how would you like your own show? I'm like, are you kidding me? My own show? If somebody had told me that one day I would have my own show because I'm a commercial artist and illustrator. This literally came to me by grace, so as a thank you, of course, the minute I saw her, I had this image in my head like a light bulb in a well, comic duh. thought balloon going on my head. I said, Grace, I could turn you into a Valkyrie. Yeah. But she sent me a photograph, and then here's how it is from the pencil sketch to the finish. Yeah. And again, finding your inner superhero, I kept the photographic look, but continued with the comic, and there's her own logo, the Grace logo behind it. And there it is in the corner there. We only have a photograph, very thin, you can see behind me is a piece of graphic design I did in the early 80s for an off-Broadway play uh, based on the actress Frances Farmer. It was actually a poster put up around the walls in New York City. This is a photograph of how it looked, plastered you know, on the sides of the uh, walls there where you see most posters in New York City. Most people, when they think of Francis Farmer, they think of the Jessica Lange film that happened to come out the same year, but later. So the Broadway play was actually before that. 
Now we come again to this image of the St. Lawrence Comics poster over here on the wall. Again, I don't have a good shot of it, but you get a sense of it. I actually photographed St. Mark's place and it was the background. And of course, a lot of the stuff is no longer here. That was always a great icon. But that's what I used to make that image in the show. Then below it, you're going to see this image. It's two images of Batman. Now, this is for all ages, so hide your children. But you've got Batman on the left saying, fuck you, Adams. And then you have this image going, Adams went to shoot and learned how to draw. This is a goddamn art studio, isn't it? Well, that, of course, is Neil Adams, the guy I worked for. In the intervening years since I've been on my own, I've always gone back and paid homage to Adams. His Batman work was brilliant. I did a sketchbook of his work. There's the cover of the sketchbook. The reason why Batman's not on the cover is because DC Comics wanted like $40,000 to use it, and the publisher didn't want to pay it. So my title page of the Neil Adams sketchbook was really supposed to be the cover. And if you think, that's like a little sketch about this tall, and that's the quality of Neil's drawing. This Batman, he to me is the greatest living Batman artist, and it's not so much for bombastic images, but as beautiful, serene, quiet images like this that stand out for me. And it's this image that I used when I started a Facebook group called Neil Adams Almanac. So of all the Batman images I could have used, that's the image I chose, and that's how much I love it. But what Adams was responsible for was, again, going from this, which I thought was ridiculous. <laughs> Batman has white eyes. Whenever the eyes show through the mask, they look cross-eyed. Neil Adams' Batman looked like this. That is the cool Batman. So when I was working for him as a gag, as a prank, I drew this picture of Batman and left it lying around the art studio for him to find. So of course, it's quiet. There's about 12 of us working. Late morning, I leave it out conspicuously. Neil comes down off of the place he worked, this elevated platform. He sees the picture. No expression change. Picks it up, looks at it. Goes right back up to his desk. Puts it on his light box. Puts a piece of paper over it. And draws this image. <laughs> and you can really see the difference between the master and the student. So, of course, he just took this picture, came down, and like flung it at me. And of course, I had a frame. Then, on the very opening day of the show, I decided to bring it here and display it. And I'm glad I did because it really illuminates so much in two pictures. As we go down the wall here, you see my Super Santa. This is what happens when you give a nice Jewish boy a Christmas card to do. Yeah. So my Santa is working out, kicking butt, and taking names. And you can see for the actual card that's here on display, here's the card. I actually did another knockoff of my little DC symbol. It says Santa Claus Comics Group. And then the seal at the top says, not approved by the Comics Code Authority, approved by the Christmas Card Authority. Yeah. And then when you open it up, it says, you better watch out because Santa's coming to town. Then, of course, this is my friend Christopher Sano, great cartoonist. Behind me, you've got my picture of Jesus. I call this Jesus comic style because I thought the dots would work great. I based this on the most well-known Jesus of modern times by an artist in the 40s named Warner Stallman. He painted a series of these. I think to date, 500 million of these have been sold around the world. According to Time magazine, this is the most recognized image in like Western culture. It's also responsible for why most people today think Jesus is a blonde Scandinavian man and it comes from this image. So all <laughs> I did was kind of pay homage to it but make him in a more praying position. Then of course, next to Jesus, you've got what the Captain Israel. Captain Israel is a Jewish superhero I created in 2002 during the second Intifada. And I was contacted by this Jewish organization, a pro-Israel organization, excuse me, called Stand With Us, based in LA. And they liked my character, and they said, let's have a couple of comic books get across the story of Israel. So for the first issue, I said, let's have, basically, give me eight pages, and I'll tell the whole story of Israel, from biblical times to modern times. 
And if you notice, I threw in some of my research, that's Mark Twain, talking about how, why is the Jew immortal when all other cultures have faded out? Why is the Jew still with us? So I attempted to answer that question in the eight pages. Of course, I based Captain Israel totally on Captain America. Why? Captain America was created by two Jewish comic artists, Yaakov Kurtzberg. You don't recognize Yaakov Kurtzberg? Jack Kirby. Changed his name to Jack Kirby. And his partner, Joe Simon, who did not change his name. They create Captain America in 1941, almost a year before America goes to the war, because America was very isolationist. And they decided, we need a character, this is right after the birth of Superman and Batman, a patriotic character to elevate the consciousness of isolationist America. That Captain America was overnight success. They actually dressed up actors to stunt for war bonds. So I'm sitting in my studio in 2002 during the Second Intifada when people are getting blown up in Israel. And I'm thinking, how can I help Israel? I don't have the money to give to Israel. But I thought to myself, you know what? If two Jews can create Captain America, one Jew can create Captain Israel. <laughs> so that's how, and I guarantee you, this is the first pro-Israeli army image ever created in the history of the Israeli army or the history of art. And then in the comic, this is how, as I'm telling the story, I inset the panels that carry, basically it's like a docu-comic. And that's how it looks on the wall. Now, next to Captain Israel, we have what really Captain Israel represents is super peace. And this image was a kind of a Lichtenstein knockoff because I've got the dots. Some images, I use dots, some images, I don't. But this was done for a lecture series that I gave to the CUNY Graduate Center here in New York City back in 2002. And it actually was the precursor to the Silver Age of comic art because for a lecture, I decided to call it Super Heroes in the 60s, Comics and Counterculture, because the, the art and the characters themselves paralleled the decade of the 60s. So you had the establishment superheroes like Superman and Green Lantern turning it over to the super anti-establishment heroes, the counterculture heroes like Spider-Man and the whole Marvel comics. They were like super anti-heroes in a way. So that's how this image came to be and how it winds up on the wall. And you can see how underneath all the images come with little comic book panels that serve to kind of tell the backstory to the people looking in the gallery. Then right next to Super Peace Man, I've got Super Money Man. Now what am I saying here? I don't want to self-analyze, but the same wall. You can only serve God or Mammon. You can't serve both. So I've got Super Money Man right next to Captain Israel. But the reason why I've done this image is that because the Clark Kent shirt opening image has become such an icon that you don't even have to be a comic fan to recognize that image. And that's why when you're an advertising illustrator, oh, by the way, I, of course, used it for the poster, but the very first time I did this image, it was for an advertising usage for a sweepstakes drawing. That's Captain Marvel, man. Yeah. Well, again, I used, I was paying homage to the Captain Marvel, the yellow lightning bolt, the red outfit. But the, the image of the Clark Kent ripping his shirt open I've used and reused literally almost hundreds of times because it is such an iconic image to the point where now I tell advertisers, just awesome. use the image and I'll stick your logo there and you have an instant, <laughs> That's great. You have an instant image. Great. Here's Grace and I at the opening and it's the only picture I have. The blurred image in the background is my one page autobiography. That's actually the last page of my Silver Age book. And there's the cover of the expanded edition. When you go up close, it's basically telling the story of uh, my brother and I. Uh, we lost our father. I was four months old. My mother raised us. She sent us to summer sleepaway camp very early so that we would get male role models. She was assuming the counselors. Well, my real role models were Superman, Batman, all the superheroes. So my idea of Mount Rushmore is this. Not a bunch of presidents. Anyway, a couple of years ago on Facebook, somebody did this image, and I don't know whether they were influenced by my image or whether they did it on their own, but yeah, let's start a petition for that. <laughs> then you go down to the bottom. 
this was basically me in eighth grade. I always tried to get comics into regular schooling. So basically I said we had to do an oral report and it had to be informational. Didn't matter what it was. So I had just read Starango's History of Comics about the lawsuit between Superman and DC Comics suing Captain Marvel for infringement. And they won. Oh. Yeah, you believe it? Anyway, so that was the kind of stuff I did. Of course, visual aids for extra credit. Remember that? <laughs> anyway, and I talk about the language, the, the vocabulary that I learned, incognito, invulnerable. No other eight-year-old knew words like that, but we knew them from the comics. And then the last panel, back when I had a goatee, a friend of mine gave me um, a quote from the great existentialist author, Albert Camus, and she said to me, Arlen, this quote is you. And it basically, and she was right, and it goes, a man's work is nothing but the slow trek to rediscover through the detours of art those two or three great and simple images in whose presence his art first opened. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. much thanks for being here I suppose we can open it up to All any right. questions or comments oh god where do I start <laughs> <laughs> Raven while you're thinking well, well I'm, I'm just saying that uh, I'm, I'm here because of the fact that uh, much, of the much of the information and the materials that uh, Arlen has shown us I've had in my collection all along without even knowing the man, without even knowing who the hell he was, <laughs> until I met him, putting up a star and he says, you're the guy. I discovered I have fans. I have fans. I didn't know that. Which, that brings so this nice which brings me to this, this question. Yes. How does one attempt to reach uh, uh, these uh, these people? I mean, these people. The uh, the authors, <laughs> the who's ever in charge of putting all that stuff up on our walls, in our, in, uh, uh, in our magazines, in our books, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That's the struggle. That's I, the best. I, I've been, I tried, my whole career I've been doing it. I tried to be able to make the oh, musician, music, but the artwork still kept up to me. You, you've seen my... Yeah. How the fuck does someone do this, man? Well, like I said, it's an uphill struggle. It's, it's Sisyphean. Awesome. In the sense that I've been pushing that boulder up the hill, and I'm still doing it. Yeah. But look, the fact that I'm here today in an art gallery, 15 years ago, this would have been unthinkable. Art galleries weren't showing comics. Museums weren't showing comics. Now, the Museum of Modern Art, they have yet to do wow. a major comic show. And that's modern art. Yeah, but my point is, so think about it. Historians are going to look at the Museum of Modern, modern, modern Art. And what until they do comics, you can never really say comics have actually arrived because just like the New York Times is the paper of record, MoMA is the museum of record. They've had little comic-inspired things, but nothing that I would curate. My goal one day is to curate that type of show. The way I would do it is very different from just sticking original art up on the walls. The original art's nice, but my idea of doing a comic book museum show is radical and multimedia and would be something that's never been done before. And, and the town is right because of the fact that for the past, geez, for the past three decades, we've had like superhero uh, movies coming up to yes. Yin Yang. Some of them have done well, some of them have done poorly, but the fact that uh, these people are given the shape to give it to Hollywood, why not the most of the museums? Fuck. Well, again, everybody, everything is at its own pace. The reason why they're doing superhero movies is that the older guard that thought comics were crap have kind of died off. And the younger guard that's in the group that grew up during the 60s is now in charge. They're greedy. We knew when we were kids that if Hollywood took superheroes seriously, they would be great movies. And we knew, like I said, we knew comic books were graphic novels. And if they were printed in hardcover, they would be great. And it just took time. You know, yeah, rock and roll was the same way. I there were no rock and roll so. critics. There were no rock and roll reviews. But what happened was in the late 60s, fans of rock and roll took jobs right. as exactly. editors and writers. Yeah. And they started to write about it because they were working. They were subverting from within. Yeah. Somehow or another, somebody at a gallery 
or at a museum that has to be a comic fan yeah. and push from the inside. I'm like on the outside and I don't have really a famous name. I can't just go up to the museum art and say, hey, let me curate a show. But maybe one day, I don't know, but I try every day. And like I said, the fact that we're here today in a downtown gallery is because things have changed that somebody like me, that I can be given a show and I don't even do traditional comics. And yet here we are in an art gallery with my stuff. So things are changing, but yet in many ways they're still the same. So it's like a lot of things. The arc of justice is a long arc, but it bends toward freedom, which I think something Martin Luther King said. Mm -hmm. And it's true for comics that eventually, in the same way that that article I'm doing called Art and Comic Art, I'm doing it for future historians so that if things change, over time, they're going to look back and say, when did they start comparing superhero artists to the great Renaissance masters? Maybe my article will actually change minds. And this is why things change. People write manifestos. It starts out, they're disrespected. They're not respected. They're not known. But a rolling stone gathers moss. And if you look at the history of art movements, and impressionism was looked down upon. Mm -hmm. Pop art was looked down upon. They thought Roy Lichtenstein was going to appear and disappear. And he proved all the critics wrong by having one of the greatest careers in you know modern painting. And I wanted to add, if I dare, um, about your character, uh, Oblak. For a while, uh, <laughs> DC had a, had a side a uh, label called Milestone, where they where yes. they did his black superheroes. Yes. What, what one of the most uh, visuals was was a yes. young lad called Static. Yes. And uh, I don't know whether it's racism. I don't know whether uh, whether people uh, don't don't uh, get they don't get it. There still aren't enough inner city superheroes where it were the shit parents. When Neil Adams got together. With uh, Danny O'Neill, Danny O'Neill, uh, and and had uh, Green Lantern and, and Green Arrow search out for the real America. Often they went to the inner cities, and who did they find? I'm not going to say it. I like Luke Cage. Ah, thank you. That was that was Marvel's was one uh, contribution to that. Yeah, yeah, Luke Cage is still crazy. around, by the yeah, way, yeah, yeah. but he, except that he's more like, <clears throat> except that he shaved his head. He's wearing like regular like. Like street, I like the chain belt. I like the chain belt. Yeah, <laughs> but you know, you're right about that. Thank you. Any other questions or comments about? I have a comment. It's, yes, I went to summer camp my whole life too uh, when I was a kid growing up, and many, many years started being a counselor. So once, uh, one year, I was in uh, the uh, where they where they would give sleeping bags out. I forget what they called the training club, and the board. It was an old, old camp. The boards fell away. Uh, and we found old comic books. Ooh, it looks mm -hmm. like a treasure trove. Yeah, mm -hmm. like, yeah, well, they either fell or <laughs> That's something. better than a case of Playboys. <laughs> <laughs> I, I found that too on Avenue X. <laughs> 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 it was a whole shopping couple, but that's another story. <laughs> they were old, like Walt Disney comics, like Mickey Mouse, so it's also a, a Bobby Sherman comic book from like 65. First issue, I still have it. Oh, Lord. I, I, mean, I wish it would have been a. You know, an early, that says more about an early than Superman. Superman. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I wish it would have been the first <laughs> issue of Action Comics. Yeah, that was your playbook. Yeah. Yeah. No, no Ben Morello was my playbook. <laughs> All right, then. Hey, anybody else? So you have one more, one more week that you're doing this? No, no, June four, four more. Doing next, next week. week. I'm oh, like oh, turning on so Batman, Thursday, Bob Kane. The next Day. one, the next right. one is next a good one. Next week is Batman, yeah. Bob Kane, okay. Little Finger. The Except week after that, we're having a double party. birthday comic book Bye costume party. party. Because Ooh. Grace and I are both Gemini's on June 6th. But you're also going to have a lecture as well, right? Well, well, no, 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 not that night. I thought it was just the costume party. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You're not doing a lecture? I thought you were doing a lecture and then... I did not. It was just a... Thank you. So no streaming that night, right? Yeah, No, you're streaming anyway. But okay, so we can party. talk about that, but yeah, I didn't know that. I thought it was just the costume party, but believe me, I can throw something down. Oh, no, I know. Okay. Um, you can, yeah, but know that much. And then, yes, and then uh, the week after that, I'm doing a thing called Man and Superman, specifically about oh, Superman. Oh, just Thor Man? I, I really like Thor Man. What? 
Doorman. 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 He's a 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 on the Silver Age of Comics. Oh, no, no, so no. this was the more general sort Just of cool tour. It's a much cooler tour. Thank, Thank you. Thank you for being the audience. Have we been live streaming the Q&A? Yeah. Everything. Everything, great. Okay. Live Thank right you now. all, guys. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Hey, so Arlen, that's it? You want me to stop? Okay. Oh yeah, I guess that's it, sure. Fantastic.